think we, we are going to start. We will have more people joining later, yes. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for your time and your interest, yes. Um, you know, uh, I explain what is International HR Talks, yes, Emma. Um, yeah. This is a format, a new format. We started in January together with my social media manager, Eva Romeo. And uh, we are inviting people from all over the world, the most disruptive ones, to tell us uh, what is happening with the function of people and what is hap happening with the organizations and people inside and what are the latest trends, yes? And that's why we invited today Emma, because for me, she is one of the people person in, in Spain, top, 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 top. Yeah? She's really very disruptive and uh, we wanted to hear the latest news from Emma to give us new insights and uh, yes, blow, mind-blowing experience, okay? Um, Emma, before you start, I wanted to ask you three questions I prepared. Go ahead, go yeah? ahead, dear Sylvia. You always say HR doesn't exist anymore. Why? <laughs> <laughs> because definitely HR as it used to be, so we need to get out of the, from the closet. <laughs> So it's true that we are in a very exciting moment in which, um, so it's the moment of HR consumerization, which is instead of being that kind of back office and more transactional model. So it's time to embrace that kind of client centric approach. And uh, to me, it's true that to us, this is so normal to be called business part partners, but we never thought of as a, I don't know, as a buyer to be considered as a business partner. And it's kind of crazy because I, actually business is made of people and we are the experts of people. So why do we have to satisfy ourselves by being partners of the business? We are business indeed. Of course. So, so to me, HR is a kind of transversal thing, the same as, as innovation. So everyone has to be able to work with innovation, not only an innovation department. Everyone has to be able to work with people, not only an HR department. So I think that uh, maybe it's time for us also to reframe our, ourselves. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you. Second question. How do, you, how do you see the future of people HR? Well, the future is, our, in our, is in our hands. So we will do and we will become what we really want to become. So the thing is in my projects, so I'm seeing too many HR people or too many HR departments who are kind of slaves to procedures or processes, which are totally old style or uh, slaves to tools or even to softwares, which are not a big help at the end of the day, but just a burden. And, and, and definitely uh, right now we have the chance of opening the door, having a look out and see what is going on out there. So we are in a fantastic moment in which people with plenty of experiences of years and people with plenty of energy and maybe without experience with plenty of energy and, and, and talent and spark. So we can mingle and, and, and shape a new way of understanding the, 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 way, of, uh, the way of how people or talent or people and talent or people and culture departments mingle and, and help organizations and are kind of really of real boosters of the organization, you know? So instead of being those transactional people who are the ones who are chasing people to, uh, to fill up the appraisal reviews or who are there kind of, uh, you know, um, obsessed about, uh, come on, let's let's make this compliance and whatever which is very important as well but maybe for us it's essential to be the ones who are kind of catalyzers in that sense and who create a kind of revolution within organizations it doesn't matter if they are public or private if they are big or small and regardless of the industry and uh, we are the ones who can help industries into create a client slash human-centric approaches. When I mean about client, it's not only talking about external client, but about internal clients, so about the co-workers. We cannot reach the heart of an external client without an internal client. And maybe it's time right now to shape organizations with a human perspective. So the origin of a process, it doesn't have to be the process per se, but the final user of this process. This is something that we will talk about today because when we are talking about evolution, transformation, cultural change, digitalization, you name it, and most of the times it's because we are obsessed about the procedure or the process, but we are not really thinking about who is the final user 
of this mm -hmm. tool or this software or this process that we are inventing or creating out of the blue. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this new vision. Emma, my last question. Do you remember 2018? Yeah. When you come to our HR conference on stage and the robot Sophia was interviewing you. <laughs> yes. Ah, yes. So it was a high moment for me. It's yes. like, how oh my goodness, being feel, interviewed by how Sophia. You, how did you feel and what do you think is the future of AI in recruitment? <laughs> Well, actually, Sophia hired me at the end. Huh? <laughs> yes, I was hired by Sophia. Not everyone can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, you know, I have a very positive and very optimistic approach of not only IE, but everything related to science. You know that I am a professor at, at, at IE, at Instituto de Empresa in Madrid. There I am in the Master of Digital Business and Technology and, and, and Innovation. And definitely my topic there is digitalizing business functions. So uh, I'm a big enthusiast about this. So um, IE uh, and technology in general. So I think they are big boosters of human creativity. But definitely we need to value human creativity and human skills and human spark to really uh, use the most of technology. So um, I remember a colleague of mine asked me about the specific software, uh, which was based on predictive index uh, applied to HR. And he asked me, what do you think about that? And I think, well, uh, as far as you're using this as a kind of support, but uh, not as a kind of mantra for everything, I'm super happy to do that. So we are in a that, that very special time in, in which we must understand that artificial intelligence, uh, data, tech, everything. So they are big boosters that will help us to avoid these three Ds, right? Dirty, <laughs> dirty, dull, and dangerous tasks. And they will enable us uh, to put our human nature at best and be really human at last when it's time to work and shape new ways of working and new working amb ambiences and, and workplaces. Great. I think everybody has now woken up after after lunch. Yes, with your speech and your shaking. <laughs> Guys, no. okay. okay, Emma, go on. We are here to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much, guys. Well, as always, it's such a pleasure to be invited by you, Sylvia, and to be sharing time. I really appreciate, guys, that you find a, a, a moment in your very busy agendas to be here mingling. And, and definitely remember that this session is yours. So I'm going to start to share my slides and to share my, my, my insights and so on. But feel free to interrupt me. Whatever the case, at the end, we will have a Q&A uh, uh, slot anyway. But feel free to interrupt me. And, and of course, so um, feel free to, to challenge me as well. Oh my goodness, I see Eileen here as well. Oh my goodness, hello. Yes. <laughs> hello. Oh it's, it's family and friends, definitely. Hey, today. why not? <laughs> oh my goodness, so happy to see you. Very, Very happy good. to. <laughs> Very good. So guys, let's start with today's session, because definitely today's session, we are going to call it um, diversity as a digital mindset booster. But actually, we could call it diversity as innovation booster, diversity as uh, brackets, anything new, everything new booster, right? And it's true that uh, digitalization has been a concept that right now it's a kind of commodity thing. And we have been talking about digitalization for far too long and far too much. And this is why I didn't choose digitalization, but digital mindset. But still, what I'm seeing in my day-to-day -day projects, you know that usually I'm not a speaker, but I am working within the organizations, helping them and co-working with them. And still, what I find is that the digital mindset um, is a still a kind of challenge, right? It's true that we are seeing, and maybe in your organizations, maybe you are seeing that in your projects as well, guys, or maybe you are experiencing this in your organizations, within your organizations. So it's true that at this point, which we are right now, April 2022, more or less, everyone has embraced a digital workplace. Everyone is more or less happy with Teams, with Microsoft Teams, or with Zoom, or with Whereby, everyone more or less. So it's also experiencing those uh, Microsoft Teams dramas, which is agendas which are loaded with meetings and so on, right? So I think this is a, this is a common place that is very familiar to, to us all. It doesn't matter the country or it doesn't matter the industry. The reality is that almost everyone has been investing in a project which is related to digitalization or digital mindset, right? 
But most of the time, when people check the results of their digital mindset, mindset project, usually everyone is very, uh, let's say, um, disappointed, right? Because it's true that it doesn't matter if it's a transformation office or if it's the people and culture or HR teams, or if it's something that has been created, I don't know, or launched by the change uh, management team or whatever, digital mindset uh, or digitalizations or transformation projects so are really exhausting. And it's true that not all the times, so you are um, harvesting the fruits, right? So I don't know if it rings a bell to you guys, Definitely. It's a, it's a common scenario, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the thing gets worse <laughs> when you check the bill of the consulting firm who led your digital mindset project, right? Which is, oh my goodness. So we have been investing that much energy and that much money. And at the end of the day, uh, still, so they are so many boxes I cannot tick in my, in my implementation, right? What is the point? The point is that uh, something that I can observe is that digital mindset, but again, we can talk about innovation, for example, and it will be exactly the same. The narrative will be exactly the same. Digital mindset, it's not about following a process, but it's about embracing a trend. So most of the programs or projects that I see uh, about uh, transformation, innovation, digitalization, uh, embracing digital mindset, you name it, Everything, every project is about a process. It's about the process and it's conceived and implemented in this way. But at the end, embracing something new, it's not a process. It's exactly the same as when we decide to embrace something new in our closet, for example. So there's a big, uh, and thinking about Pedro, that also comes from the fashion business, and also our dear Deepak, who is connected from India, right? Also coming from the fashion business. So, and 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 Eileen, that all, all also worked for a while in the fashion business as well, together with us in Inditex. So we can say that there are plenty of common things between embracing new trends in clothes, right? And embracing new trends in the way of work, right? And, and, and definitely the thing is much more um, simple but what we can say, as Leonardo da Vinci says, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication nowadays. Uh, so let's see how can we make our life simple when it's time to embrace new ways of working within the workplace. Point number one, why most organizations decide to go digital? Or why most organizations think uh, that they have to go digital, right? So if we scratch and we have a look deep inside, we will see that well, so the idea, it's not the mere purpose of buying a new software, or it's not the mere purpose of launching in, in, at LinkedIn uh, an advertisement about how cool we are, that we are uh, working with this new uh, digital partner, right? At the end of the day, the digital mindset is just an enabler for every single organization. It doesn't matter the industry, and it doesn't matter the product, to either engage or delight, or getting closer to their clients. And when I'm talking about clients, I am talking about the client community. I am talking about the only client. That means the external client, the external audience, the external consumer, but also the internal client, right? The coworkers, the employers, the, the employees, the partners. So it depends the name, uh, the company is calling uh, people working within or for this organization. Of course, here, so the ones who already attended one of my sessions, so you are with, uh, very familiar with that slide. And, but, uh, so sorry to see that slide again, but I think that this is a kind of slide that again and again is the very backroom to understand many of the issues or challenges that organizations are facing right here, right now. Because when I'm thinking about the client, definitely every single organization has very three, very different three universes, right? strategy, tactics, and operations. Being a strategy, the ones deciding the what, tactic is the ones Sorry, deciding Emma, the how. But yeah. the slides are not changing, I think. I don't know if it's for everyone. We are at the first one, diversity as a digital mindset booster. Oh, yes, and it's you, very small, and it's very small, yes. So if ah, you and it's not, if you it's not changing? Again, no. The no. slides are not changing? No. no. Oh my goodness, how comes? How comes? Let me see, let me see. 
Ah, because okay. it really changes in my... What, no, what do no, you no. see now, guys? I think it's the strategy, tactics, and operation. I don't know if it's for everyone the same. But you see that? Yes, but it's very small. Can you make it enlarge it? And if I do like that, what do you see? Yes, but it's small. Oh, it's and small? It's let me small see. Let me see. Hold on. Or in a presentation hold mode. Hold on, hold on. I think hold that on. if you... Yeah. It's fine, guys. It's Hold on, stay here yeah. with me. Stay here with me because <laughs> now okay. this is no. this is because of my monitor. Sorry about that. Okay. No, it's okay. Yes. Now no, it's okay. okay. Emma. No, it's okay. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. It was my monitor, guys. Sorry about that because I was in my desktop. Okay. Now you see it well. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, Emma. It's better now. Very good. Fantastic. So then let's continue. Thanks for letting me know because otherwise I would have been continued talking about my things and you would be there. So mm -hmm. totally at your own things. Okay, so then again, so every single organization has these three big layers, these three big universes, strategy, tactics, and operations, right? And the truth is that when we decide uh, that we need to launch a project, it doesn't matter if it's digitalization, cultural transformation or whatever. So we see that the strategy teams, they are the ones taking the decision, right? Tactics teams, they are the ones pushing to make the decision happen, right? And they are the ones deciding the how. Oh my goodness, Pedro, I see that you are there. So very like a good student, huh? but do not worry because we are going to share the slides. <laughs> <laughs> but very good. I like, I like that. You're going to have an excellent. You're going to have an excellent at the end of the session. <laughs> Super. Thank you so much. <laughs> right? But pay attention because there's a very interesting uh, point of that, which are the operations, right? A quick question for you guys. Um, the final client of an organization, the final user, is in touch with whom exactly? With a strategy, with tactics, or with operations? What do you think? Operations. Definitely. Operations. Definitely. So uh, operations represent the client regarding, uh, sorry, represents the company regarding the client. And not only that, operations, they are the ones who really know the client the most, right? Very good. And when we are talking about internal client, when we are talking about employees of the organization, where do we find the highest percentage in strategy, in tactics, or in operations? What do you think? In operations, I guess. In operations too, right? So uh, when we go, for example, so to a business model, like for example, I don't know, my all, all, all house in Detex, right? And the Zara stores or the mango stores talking about mango, right? So definitely operations are the stores, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if they are digital or if they are physical. And of course, is where you find the highest percentage of internal community within this organization, right? The question is, how often those strategies, digitalization, cultural change, et cetera, how often those strategies involve the operations teams? Never. <laughs> and this is the key of the drama, right? The key of the drama is that every time I lead a digital mindset, digitalization, innovation, transformation project or whatever, I do that address to my main internal client. My main internal client are in operations, but what a drama. I'm just launching strategies without asking my internal client then, right? So this is as if, I don't know, L'Oreal <laughs> was trying to launch a shampoo without doing focus groups with external clients, right? And this is something that will never happen. So in that sense, here, this is the very key of the question, to start changing our mindset about the way in which we launch projects. So it's not thinking about the process. It's not thinking about the strategy. It's just thinking about who are the ones who need to embrace that new trend that I am trying to installate within my organization. And here comes a very interesting question, which is, okay, so if the internal client of an organization is the first client of a new project, definitely, how is the internal client of this given organization? So this is a reality. If we have a look at, maybe not at the strategy teams, 
because I think that one of the biggest dramas of nowadays organizations is that strategy teams are very boring in the sense that they are very um, monolithical in that sense. They are not diverse, they are not polyhedral. But if we have a look at the operations teams, if we have a look at the biggest community of an organization, we see that it's a very clear representation of society, guys. So uh, operations teams are diverse, are polyhedral. And when we are talking about diverse, we are not only talking about men and women, we are talking about origin, we are talking about generation, we are talking about ways of understanding love and life and beliefs and everything, right? So um, there's a very clear question everybody puts when we are talking about um, creating those workplaces where people embraces changes or embraces new trends, which is, okay, is there a specific structure that really supports or makes this embracing a new uh, way of working, uh, makes that easier? And I say, no, guys, because actually, when we are talking about diverse and diverse City, we are talking about diverse generations working together. So it's not only, as I say, it's not only about genders and it's not only about uh, origins or cultures or ways of understanding life and politics and love and everything. At the end, uh, society is shaped by different generations. So we cannot expect that the workplace will not be the same because at the end, workplace is just a reflection of society. Right now, in the workplace, we are finding these four generations working together. So I know that you are very familiar with this, guys. So and this is not new, right? So we have baby boomers, X generation, Y generation, and Z generation. Why a generation is called generation, guys, actually? Why? What does that mean, generation? When I say I belong to the same generation uh, as Pedro, what does that mean? Maybe it's a way of mentality, a way of thinking, could be. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Very, very, very good. Thank you very much, Pedro. That means that we have been, work, we have been born, born in a very similar momentum, right? So in a period of time, and that means that we could have similar references, influences, uh, cultural points, and so on. That makes a generation, right? In a way, a generation shapes, uh, shapes our mind map. And it's to that, whereas a generation might never be a label to standardize everyone, it's true that societally speaking, so we can talk about specific features that are linked to every single generation. So it's more than normal that every single generation understands work and workplace in a different way, has different working mantras as well, and not only that, it's more than normal that every generation has their own perception of organizational structures. But again, organizational structures, organizational charts, are not the reality of a structure, are just a map, are just a drawing, right? So in previous seasons that we've been doing, sessions that we've been doing together, we have been discussing that at the end, the real organizational chart of an organization is the interrelations that people have with each other. So we can see that baby boomers who are super organizational and they are 100% a product of the 20th century. So they have that kind of motto, which is, hey, I do what my boss says. And it's more than normal that in their brains and in their mind, so the hierarchy, the pyramidal organization is the organization they know. X generation, my generation, for example. So it's true that um, we have been very faithful to our profession, but at the end, so we are a product of the 90s. So, and we were very keen on our job descriptions, right? So our mantra was not that much that I do what, I, what my boss say, but I do what my job description says, which was a kind of religion ages ago. And today we are seeing that job descriptions are one of the most obsolete things in every single organization, right? but we will discuss about that later. So it's true that for, uh, for us, for the ed generation, we were the ones introducing new departments as for instance, internal communication, right? And also is when the HR department appeared, right? It was the evolution from the personnel department to HR, 
or the payroll department, the evolution to HR. And, and we started to, to, to blur a little bit that kind of silos right still we kept the levels the different levels of the organization but we started to create that more bi-directional uh, approach Y generation also called millennials which are not that young anymore born between 77 and 92 so they were the one they were the ones that when entering into the into the labor market crisis was already there and definitely they started to be very critical with the system and challenge the status quo and that's why so uh, let's say that the startup movement started more or less officially with that generation and that's why to them the original structure is the flat structure which is okay i do not care about my job description so i just want to create my own thing because I don't want to be a figure anymore in that kind of big corporate. And last but not least, we have the Z generation, the youngest ones right now in the, in the, in the labor market, right? And in the workplace. And Z generation born from 93. So they are multi-career and to them, so labels do not exist. So actually Z generation, they are the ones which have been also, when we are talking about gender and when we are talking about sex life, so they have been the ones blurring all kind of labels, guys. So, and also they are doing exactly the same precisely with work, right? And holacracy, which is, I'm sure that you are very familiar uh, with that structure. So which is, so I work according to my talents. So it's not that much my, so my descriptor or my box. So it's the most common way of understanding organizations. So here we have four generations working together. So what is the best organizational chart to embrace new ways of working? All of them, <laughs> right? Because it will always depend on the kind of people I will find within the organization. What do I really mean with this? This leads me to point number three. What is the driving force of a trend? So if I wanna talk about digital mindset, or if I wanna talk about innovation, so who will be the driving force of a digital mindset within my organization? An external consultant? Of course not. A guru? Of course not. It's gonna be the people, the people who really shapes that organization. And the more diverse, the merrier. Why? What does that really mean? Well, here that, uh, that fantastic gentleman, uh, Frederic Laloux, come to the rescue, right? I, I know that you are all very familiar precisely because Sylvia, uh, I remember the first time I heard about uh, Frederic Laloux, kind of three years ago, it was, it was precisely in a session with Sylvia. And Laloux has this fantastic book, which is Reinventing Organizations. And right now there's also a comic version and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's Super interesting because um, it's true that when you realize that you are implementing something new within an organization, it doesn't matter the process. The only thing that really matters is the kind of people that shapes that organization. And depending how the people is are sorry in that organization, it will be possible for me to lead one thing or another. So it's not a matter of tools. It's not a matter of process. It's just a matter of perfectly knowing which momentum your organization is in and what are the people who are shaping this organization and this momentum, this organization and momentum. This is something that we see very clearly, for example, in football teams, right? Let's talk Barca, for example, right? So, okay, the name of the company is always the same. Yes, Barca. The logo is exactly the same. Yes, the football club, uh, you know, the crest and so on. Very good. The colors and the product is the same? Mm, yeah, definitely. But it really changes depending on the kind of players I have there, kind of coach I have there. And a match itself totally changes depending on the fans who are there supporting. So um, of course, um, the logo and the product of a company is very important, but people will be the ones really uh, taking the leading role when deciding what would be the best way of introducing new things within the company, right? And 
let's see uh, very quickly uh, which are those different companies Lalu talks about, but I'm sure that you are all very familiar with this book, right? Some of them, some of you are for sure, because we have even been discussing about this. If some of you are not familiar with this book, I really advise you to have a look at that. I, actually, it was the first book I read when I became an entrepreneur, and it's really an eye opener. What Lalu says is that depending on people shaping that organization, an organization might be in a different evolutionary stage, right? So they are more and less evolved organizations. And this evolution, it's not linked to the drawing of the, of the organizational chart. Many companies think that if they destroyed their apparently pyramidal drawing and they redesign it in shape of circles, things will change. But this is absurd because, <laughs> again, the organizational chart is just a map and the map is not the territory, right? So it is compulsory to have a look at what is going on within the organization to understand how people are and to understand what will be possible to do. Yeah. So let's have a look uh, at the first at the first organization. The stage one, it's called the red organization by Lalu. Are you familiar with this guy here in this GIF? You know who this guy is? So this is a hint for you. So this is an HBO series, which is very famous. Called The Sopranos. Are you familiar with this series, The Sopranos? <laughs> no. It's, I really advise you to have a look at this uh, because definitely it's one of the, I think it's in the ranking of the best series ever, or whatever. It's a kind of mythical series. And, and well, The Sopranos is a series about the mafia, <laughs> right? And mafia is a very clear red organization, right? So, uh, but, but uh, unfortunately, you will find red organizations which are not only mafia. <laughs> so you will find corporate organizations that are red organizations too, unfortunately. Um, for those organizations, the use of power is essential. Uh, the use of fear to control, you know? So you owe me this, or what would you do if it wasn't, uh, if I wasn't here? or mm, nobody else will you be better than here, or it's very cold outside. So, you know, all these, all these uh, mafia style sentences. And, and definitely these kind of organizations thrive in chaotic environments, right? So when there's chaos outside, um, red organizations, they like to promote fear because definitely fear, mm, well, um, enables them to, to, to act the way they do. And it's curious because when we are talking about digital mindset or when we are talking about uh, introducing uh, innovation within these kind of organizations, you will see that red organizations, they have no digital maturity. And um, if they decide that they have to introduce a specific software, so they will not try to convince people or they will not try to you know, uh, coach people to do this. So they will just um, implement this and they will force people to use this software. And that's it right something which is kind of dramatic because you have the users of this software who at the end of the day are hating this software and everything that is represented by this software right red organizations let's have a look at stage two amber organizations are you familiar with that guy this is not hbo this is netflix <laughs> Are you familiar with this guy? Or maybe you don't have that much time for series, I see. <laughs> Are you familiar with a series which is called House of oh, Cards? Oh. Definitely. Very good point. And this is Frank Underwood. Uh, um, what's House of Cards about? The, see if someone has been watching this. A very mythical series as well. Huh? Guys, it's not only about reading Lalu, it's also about getting connected with series, guys. Huh? <laughs> These are part of society. So Frank Underwood uh, is that, that character, which is, uh, you know, this man manipulative guy. I don't want to show him. I want to know, right? And, and definitely um, House of Cards is about politics, right? And talks about uh, is the history of this guy, Frank Underwood, which is a politician that does uh, everything it takes uh, to become president of the United States, right? 
Mary Hollywood style, okay? These Amber organizations, they are the ones ruled by the command and control, right? So they are the ones that really think that they can control everything, no matter how big these organizations are. Uh, these are organizations that were born in the 20th century, and the 20th century it was about controlling, yeah? But in the 20th century, we were kind of naive because we thought that we could control things. But right here, right now, I think that we are all pretty aware that many things are out of, uh, cannot be controlled, right? Uh, what is happening out there cannot be controlled. But these kind of organizations try to challenge these. And this is precisely because of that, that they have so many problems right here, right now. And the organizations are organized from up to bottom. And to them, the most important thing is stability and long-term, whatever it takes, right? These organizations, they think that still everything can be compartmentalized and that everything can be organized in little boxes as if it was in the 20th century. But the main difference is that in the 20th century, we could do that because the scenario was much more slow. Plenty of things happened in the 20th century, but uh, the rhythm and the pace of things had nothing to do with the rhythm of, of, of events nowadays, right? So since everything was slower in the 20th century, when change happens or when, when evolution happened, I had time to reorganize my little boxes. But right here, right now, I do not have the time to do so. And this is the biggest problem of AMBER organizations. They consider, when talking about uh, digitalization or when talking about digital mindset, they consider digital tools as a support to centralize information. So precisely one of the most important things about the digital tools, which is the idea of democratizing and empowering people so that everyone can do their own things, they think the other way around. They think that they can use uh, they can use digital just to uh, gather information, uh, collect information, right? And put everything into a single place. Something which is very difficult because everything happens very fast, right? And not everyone, especially in very big companies, not everyone is embracing tools in the same way. So this is something that I am facing with my multinational companies, right? In which you have, for example, the headquarters who are launching a specific project, which means implementing a specific software across all the different branches everywhere. But of course, every branch is in a different country. Every country has a different reality. Every reality means a different culture and way of understanding tools and softwares, right? So um, we are not in the 20th century anymore. So this is why Amber organizations are kind of kind of struggling. And also they are not as sexy as they, as they used to be for talent ages ago. I see that also because uh, Amber organizations to them, so everything is so structured, so hyper structured that the, 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 new, uh, the new projects, so they have those never ending implementation calendars in a way that the return on the investment is so far away that you will never see the end, or you will never really size the success of a project because it takes that long. And you have to cross so many boundaries and you have to be crossing so many bureaucracy that at the end, nothing works it. And this is, a, this is a big, big, big drama in big organizations. That lead us to the stage three. This is also a series you have to watch. Succession, <laughs> succession. This is a series from, uh, that you can, you can watch at HBO. And succession is about, well, uh, is the story of a big, uh, big, big, big holding. Uh, and is the story of the guy who created that big, big, big corporation and how he is planning his succession uh, involving uh, his siblings, uh, sorry, his offsprings, uh, daughter, and, daughter and sons. Right. So this is one of the characters who is the daughter who, well, as you can guess, more or less is a kind of typical, you know, bitchy solo player in that in that way. But but it's it's super interesting to have a look at that at that scene. Um, stage three companies are the orange companies. This is also maybe very Wall Street lookalike in that in that sense. And it's the idea of crushing the competitors, using innovation, but not for the sake of innovating, but as a weapon to crush the competitors. And also they are obsessed about this idea of scaling up. 
grow, 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 is that idea of monopoly thing, right? Grow is good, definitely, but as long as it's sustainable, right? So then we are talking about thriving, right? This is not the case of orange organizations. Unfortunately, many startups are within that kind of narrative, which is scale up, scale up, grow, grow, grow. It doesn't matter. Uh, let's do this. And in the way of that, so definitely they lose their soul. And if you lose your soul, definitely. So you lose that secret sauce that makes you special. And orange organizations, definitely, they want the last technology. They crave the last technology. But definitely, it has to be quick. They want the very last of the very last, la creme de la creme, and very quick solutions because they really want to know everything about their clients, but not to delight the client. So just to poof, create something quick so that they can stuff their clients with and so that so the clients can buy their products. Right. So it's not I know the client to sympathize with the client. And the more I know and the more I sympathize, the better products I can offer. It's like, OK, I know a lot about you because like that. So I can sell plenty of things <laughs> to this. Client. So it's very 90s mind as well. So and, and actually, um, they, they do not care much about the final user when they are trying to implement new ways of process will be implemented, whatever it takes. Right. So there's kind of common points with red organizations as well. So which is, OK, we have to do that. We will do that, whatever. OK, <laughs> very good. So let's go to stage four. I'm sure that you are familiar with that series. Mod uh, modern Family. Thank you very much. I was about to have a stroke. I say, well, if they are not familiar with that series, Love so it. then, vamos, <laughs> <laughs> modern family right modern family is a very clear example of what we call green uh, organizations right so we see that uh, modern family we see an example of an organization which is a slightly pyramidal right we have that kind of pater familias who is jay pritchett right the the husband of of gloria but we see that definitely um, the team members in that case, the family members, they are kind of empowered, right? Each one of them, they are living their own lives uh, and, and so on. And definitely they mingle and they, 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 they meet in specific moments and they have a very interesting relationship uh, across them. But each one of them, they, they live their lives. But something which is very crucial in these kind of organizations is that idea of culture and celebrations and, and shared momentums. Right. So there are specific companies in which you really feel that how important it is, the legacy, the history of the other, and some specific celebrations which are crucial and, and, and specific ceremonies that uh, that are very, very key for them. I was the other day I was just uh, checking that um, in that uh, in the group of, of, of people directors. So someone was asking about what do you do when someone is celebrating, I don't know, 25 years in the company and so on, right? So um, these kind of celebrations are super important for these stage four organizations, also called the green organizations, according to Ledoux. Definitely, these kind of organizations, as you might, uh, as, as you might guess, so they see digital tools more, more as an enabler to keep the community together. Right. It's very curious because when 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 you are in the middle of a in the middle of a project with them and they are very worried about these kind of softwares, for example, which uh, which involve collaboration or this kind of uh, softwares that are very linked to NPS, but applied to internal client and these kind of softwares that encourage uh, a transversal communication across departments. Right, and this is super super interesting to have a look at it, and um, and definitely since they are so user oriented, being the user the internal client, for them, the tech has to be easy to use. If you need long implementations, if you need plenty of consultants to implement this, and if this is something that uh, it's super uh, let's say sophisticated, so they do not get along very well with these kind of tools. So it has to be. Uh, comfortable to use and very focused uh, into the final user, right? So this goes for these uh, green organizations. And there's the last stage for LALU, which is the teal organizations, right? 
pay attention because still organizations, many people believe that they are the super uh, fantastic uh, organizations. Every single organization has darks and uh, lights and shadows, okay? Till organizations are what I call the Lego organizations, right? Those organizations where everyone thinks as an intrapreneur. No, I remember that we had the session with Fred, with Fred Ten, who was talking about intrapreneurship, right? So these are the kind of organizations. So self-managed teams, dynamic roles, shared purpose and culture to create that kind of working framework. Right. So these are the typical organizations where everyone is so empowered that everyone is able to shape their own jobs. And when there's an issue, people are ready to give initiatives and give solutions. So they are not like in other organizations where people look up and say, OK, let's wait for the management team to give a solution. Right. And in these kind of organizations, digital is a state of mind. So technology is just a way to channel this way of this way of, of behaving. And to them, uh, they use tech precisely to empower the entrepreneurial side of teams. Again, if my software is a software which is not releasing that entrepreneur within me, if this is kind of monotasking me, so this kind of product, it's not, a, it's going, it's not going to be successful in this kind of organization, right? So as you see here, we are not talking about processes. Here, not, we are not talking about organizational chats. Here, just talking about people and knowing people from the inside out. So, and my very last slide is about those very little recipes that always work, or that at least they have always been working for me. So this is like a, the kind of pantry staples, right? <laughs> that we can always, that we can always use. First of all, so uh, what is essential is to understand first, what is the stage of the company? Live its culture. If you are doing a project, but you are not mingling with people, you will not really size uh, the opportunities of, of, even if you are co-working with that company as an external consultant or as an external advisor. So you need to be in the canteen with everyone, or you need to be there mingling with some of the operations, because definitely this is where your clients are, because they will be the ones who need to adopt what you will propose, right? So it is essential to understand what are the meaningful drivers for this organization? Because every project deserves a storytelling, deserves a narrative. And this is something we usually forget. We think about the PowerPoint, we think about the process, bam, and we expect the miracle, right? And it never happens like this. Every single project is addressed to people. Therefore, I need to know people. And if I also want to move people towards this new change I want to create, I need the proper storytelling for that. So important, point number two, identify early adopters. So I know that you are all familiar with the Rogers curve that was invented in 1962 about early trendsetters, early adopters, uh, mainstream and so on. So do not expect that everyone will embrace at once uh, a new thing. But what is important, look for the ones who are really enthusiastic to do so and use them as your internal advocates. So that is this is this is crucial because at the end of the day, point number three, going digital or innovating or unleashing creativity or all new things that you might imagine, it's not rocket science. For example, when we talk about going digital, we all embrace digital in our private lives, right? So reverse mentoring, for example, is a fantastic way to promote fresh, uh, a fresher thinking within an organization. Understanding by reverse mentoring, younger people supporting more experienced people, right? So uh, in, all the, in all the development projects that I am implementing lately, uh, recently, sorry, so um, reverse mentoring is a part of this and, and it's for free, so it's great. And, and last but not least, so talking about diversity, which is the very core of our session today. So diversity, again, is about celebrating and nurturing ourselves, our authenticity, right? So as I told you, it goes beyond gender. It goes uh, beyond culture. It goes beyond, pers beyond perspectives and love and life and politics, right? The reality is that 
if we are not diverse or if the ones shaping a strategy, whatever it is the strategy, is not a diverse team, if everyone, and, and here we are not only talking about all male panels, right? But the, the, it's not that the only issue. So it's that kind of panels, it's not an issue of gender, which it is, but it's also an issue of race, is an issue of generation. It's even an issue of ways of being dressed. <laughs> so if everyone looks the same, the project will be a project which is shaped for monolithical persons. And we are seeing that society is diverse and organizations are diverse, especially the biggest community of an organization, which is the operations teams. So it's about understanding that authentic projects and not copy paste projects, only authentic projects are the sustainable ones, the really coherent ones, the really relevant ones, and the really, the really ones uh, which is really worth paying for. And digitalization will not be an exception, but I mean, not only digitalization, every single project you launch. So my, 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 very, my very point to here would be saying that it is time to embrace a multiple approach of our own. It's exactly the same as coffee. If I am asking you guys, how do you like coffee? So we will have different tastes into here and we will even have people who do not like coffee, <laughs> right? So everything has to, has to be taken this way. The more diverse the approach, the better chances I have to be successful at this new implementation I want to make. And, and that was my session for today, <laughs> guys. Thank you so much, Emma. It's always so refreshing. <laughs> I feel refreshed. <laughs> thank you. And, yes. Thank you but it's my pleasure, insights. but guys. Yeah, thank you for the new insights. Uh, we have some minutes left, Emma, and I yeah. would like people to have the opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, so definitely. Go on. Yes, everybody, go on, please. Come on, guys. Use this as a group I therapy. Have, I have well. one. Just let me start my camera. Hi, this is Alessandra. Hi, Alessandra. Hi. <laughs> it's been some How years now. How are you, my dear? Ah, good, good to see you. you. Thank you so much for sharing all this. Always interesting and challenging Pleasure. in our minds. Thank you. I was just fig figuring here if by your clients or experiences that you may have had, if you know any companies that were successful in turning into the, the TO stage, the stage number five, mm -hmm. how they successfully created this work environment where they had time or I don't know the rituals to flourish all these um, dynamic roles and self-management styles and etc because I understand that this is a change in management that also requires a lot of time right to Definitely. building up from the scratch in the team. Hmm. Uh, do you have any experiences to share with us about this? Definitely. And you know what? There's something interesting about th this again. So it, Teal has its lights and shadows. So that, that, that's for sure. But uh, what is so perfection doesn't exist. And, and that's the way it has to be. But something that is interesting is that many, many times we assume that a whole organization has to be Teal. But many times it's not like this. Maybe it's only a department. Or maybe it's only a very specific part of the community. You know, so and it might be that little by little, when the rest of the organization see that this community is thriving, right? So they jump into it and they embrace that. But pay attention because if you want to create a kind of Lego deal uh, department or team, the very core of these again are people. Mm -hmm. Are people? What happens? They are people who do not like to be teal or do not like to be Lego. They like to be told what to do. And this is something that we might realize and that we might respect, right? But on the other hand, you might find people who really have this kind of internal drive, right? In that case, things that always work. I go very quickly, uh, Alessandra, but if you want, so we chat and we catch up yeah. and I tell you in more, in more detail, but something that always worked. So to me, so by Pedro, by Pedro. So to me, what always worked. So ask people, so to release their own entrepreneur. So to instead of giving them a job description, it's like shape your own description, your own job description by using a Canvas business model, right? So when you are totally empowered because you've been creating your own job, 
So there you see what KPIs are important for you, which clients are important for you, who are your key partners and so on. So definitely, so this is the beginning of everything, right? So you have people who are aligned around the primary business purpose, who are able, according to their experience or their talents, to create and shape their own roles. And like this, the magic, which is not magic, is logical, happens. Something very important as well is just to make sure that the natural talents of people are naturally lined up with the kind of job they have to do. So here it's very, you know, Howard Gardner, multiple intelligences thing. But at the, again, so in my case, that I am not logical mathematical, if I would be, I don't know, in, in an accountancy department, uh, it's impossible that I would be a top contributor or that I have innovative ideas because they will not match with my natural talents, with my authenticity. So authenticity is essential and then empower this authenticity with the right tools. Something that really upsets me is when people want to implement innovation projects, but at the same time, forcing people to be within a very strict job description. So if we are putting people into cages, we cannot then ask them to fly. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah? So this is a very interesting yeah. point. Very interesting question, Alessandra. Thank, yeah, we'll, we'll Thank you, Thank you, Teresa, you go, is, is raising up her hand. Go, Teresa. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emma, for this presentation, for a super presentation for your energy, mm -hmm. for your My recommendations pleasure. on the on the series to watch. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a must. That's a must. And um, I wanted to know your opinion about a topic that sometimes arises, which is when you see that is mainly the middle management yeah. in the organization who are the stoppers. So how to cope with it? Again, so it, there's not a common there's not a common remedy for everyone because it's about meeting people and really understanding what's what's the issue in there, right? It's true that to me, middle management it's the hall of the donut nowadays, right? Because they are between the pressure of the strategy telling them what to do, and then the pressure of the operations. And right now, again, so um, operations means means the first line, the front line. And right now, with the big quit and all the trends that we are all familiar with, so there's big rotation and big attrition in, in those areas. So we can say that middle management right now, it's a kind of uh, crazy situation. So it's super important to understand what are the drivers that, that are meaningful to them and to really understand their day. So when, when I start the project, so I do never shape a project or design a project without having coffee with at least two or three members of the middle of the middle management. But it's true that each one of them will tell you different stories and also each one of them, depending on the kind of mindset they have. So you should need to activate a, tri a specific trigger. Mm -hmm. but, to, but, but to me, so again, so it is impossible to create something in a copy paste way. Mm -hmm. Another different thing is, okay, a talk, or a workshop or whatever. But when it's about project that you need to be there working with them. So it really works it. So spending one morning having coffees, even virtual ones. So to really, to really understand the real stories and narratives that are behind everyone. You will find people who are real, really willing to help and will help you to do, to do things and you will help them. But they will find kind of, uh, you know, what I call in Spanish, uh, are we all Spanish where we are here? Or we understand no, we Spanish? Are more or less? We are recording, Emma. Um, uh, I, I, the, 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 the real sca scapologists, we can say. Okay, escapistas in Spanish. So you will find, you can find plenty of them in the middle management, people who have been there surviving for plenty of years and try to covering things. And when someone arrives trying to help, to help, you need to shake things. And if you shake things, it means that uh, the things that are covered get uncovered. And from time to time, you might find some scapologists that it's like, okay, good, good. Mm, see you later in, the, in your project. And they try to keep their things, right? And then you need to go there and try to... <laughs> try to, my dearest, try Emma, to my dearest Emma, one yeah. hour is too short with Emma Genia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love I love that motto. I love that motto. <laughs> we need the time. I'm so sorry, but we have run out of time. Emma, we are recording okay. this. You can find no, it uh, in a video. We are going to send it to you. And of course, you can contact an Emma to ask her about yes. everything. Service. 
<laughs> at your service. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for having you with us. Oh, thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. All Such a pleasure. Thanks for your okay. time. Thank you. Thank you, dear Emma. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Bye, guys. Marina. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.